Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to today's uh, lunchtime uh, artist talk. My name's uh, Chris Clark. I'm senior curator here at Glucksman. Um, and this is a series of uh, online talks accompanying our current exhibition, Home, Being and Belonging in Contemporary Ireland. Um, and what we're doing is we're inviting participating artists from that exhibition uh, to come and discuss their practices, exhibited works, and recent projects. And these are going to take place uh, throughout the duration of the exhibition until the end of October. Um, and I'm very pleased today uh, to welcome you to a talk by Sinead Ni Mwenig. Uh, Sinead graduated with a BA in Fine Art Painting from Dublin Institute of Technology uh, in 2001 and was recently elected a member of the RHA, was awarded the Hotrum Artworks Award for Outstanding Work from Visual Carlo, and received an arts bursary from Wicklow County Council in 2019. In 2018, she was shortlisted for the John Moore's Painting Prize, and her solo exhibitions include shows at Kevin Cavanaugh Gallery in Dublin, Limerick City Gallery of Art, Trisco Gallery Cork, and Lynn Hall Arts Centre in Mayo. She's taken part in group exhibitions at SLAG Gallery in New York, uh, Douglas Hyde Gallery in Dublin, Mermaid Arts Centre in Wicklow, and is part of, and is part of Volta New York in a solo presentation in 2016. And her work is held in public collections, including the Office of Public Works, the Centre Cultural Irlande in Paris, uh, the Highlands Art Gallery in Drada and the Arts Council, as well as private collections in Ireland, Europe, and the USA. And she's represented by Kevin Cavanaugh Gallery in Dublin. Um, so the format for this series of talks is uh, we're going to stream a pre-recorded uh, presentation by Sinead, which is approximately 30 minutes long. Um, and then we're going to link back up here live for uh, discussion and Q&A. So if you have any questions, you can pose them at any point using the chat function. Um, and please keep in mind that these talks and conversations will be available to view on the Glucksman YouTube uh, channel afterwards. Uh, so without further ado, uh, welcome, and I'm happy to hand over to Sinead Niemuenik. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the director of the Glucksman and Christopher Clark uh, for um, doing such a wonderful job of an exhibition that's really needed at this time. So um, I'm really honoured to be part of the exhibition, and uh, I can't wait to see the show in person. It's been a very interesting year and um, I'm going to go back to the beginning really where when when I left uh, college I left DIT uh, fine art painting and I was fortunate enough to be offered a studio uh, in Henrietta Street which at the time housed many many artists and there's an often this um, conversation about artist studios and shortages but Henrietta Street was really really uh, generous for hosting many artists for many years and um, I was in the basement of a private home for approximately seven years, and that really uh, gave me a great, great kind of foundation for my practice, and uh, gave me a really good kind of positioning to kind of, uh, you know, devote myself full time to my practice. So the studio itself was very, very dark, but it was appropriate for my work, and I loved it. Um, so across the road, for example, some of the artists: Diana Copperwise, Geraldine O'Neill, Michael D, Ethna Jordan. Uh, Corbin Walker. Uh, so I had and was able to introduce myself to many artists at the time. So it was certainly, um, uh, it, was, it was like a dream come true, to be honest. You know, it was a uh, very rich, um, rich street and for many reasons, great conversations and great friendships kind of developed from that. So this is a photo of me back in the day and my practice and uh, some of the paintings on the bottom on the floor, the way they're stacked is, uh, I'm going to hopefully get to those to show you some of them. So they're very linear, maybe you can see some uh, lines etched in and, and that. But the studio was hugely important and it was very nourishing and I was delighted with myself. And for many years I was happy there. And then I had to build my own studio out the back at home in Bray County Wicklow because I always wanted to have a space to go to and return to. I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't happy to be dependent on a landlord and a temporary kind of, you know, rental system. Like just wouldn't and couldn't kind of agree with just didn't agree with me like personally like I needed that stability because it's such an unstable kind of career anyway so I was delighted uh, Christopher to be honest uh, with myself and as the purpose of the studio very small but it's uh, it's a it's a great space and in fact I did my largest work there when I built the studio I started to paint six foot painting so the painting in the Glucksman is uh, 182 centimeters by 102 centimeters so um, it's funny, I left a really large studio to uh, go home to a small one and anyway, the largest work uh, essentially has been kind of conceived there. So um, this is an important painting and it's a painting that um, really 
made me focus on structures. And this is probably one of the first times that I, uh, if you like, you know, combined many kind of painterly elements together to uh, evolve these structures. So um, this is definitely a very experimental piece and it's very, very painterly. Um, I hope the image actually uh, shows that it's very luscious as well. But I went, I kind of went towards a very minimal palette actually uh, when I began this kind of uh, body of work. So the structures themselves, I find it very, very figurative, but uh, the origins of the painting being exhibited in the Glucksman really, it's, it's probably taken me 20 years to get there, if you like, on that journey. So this is the second piece. And there are these kind of uh, nearly three-dimensional objects really that are drawn uh, into paintings. And I kind of look back on these two paintings that I've just shown you with uh, a lot of growl because they um, they kind of helped me, you know, build many bodies of work. You know, they introduced me to a new language and a language that uh, I wasn't necessarily kind of um, not comfortable with, but just it introduced me to a new language, which kind of uh, brought me on as a, an emerging artist. So it's really, really appreciative of, if you like, something so simple, uh, using a palette knife to etch uh, drawings, if you like, into painting. So. Um, they were the two and they're very, very important. So you'll notice this isn't as painterly, if you like, but it's uh, the same kind of process and the same kind of etched mark, if you like. This, the colors, again, like they're very, very simple. You know, the, the two colors. Um, I love these. And I do look back and I wonder why and how. And I'm beginning to kind of write an essay about them now, which is good for me, good for me to go back. So I'm just going to go to other examples of this work, which I find very linear. But it, it, they're very obvious. These paintings, like although you could look and view them as a viewer, you know, some ambiguity. I find that they are there's something very definite about them. They're very definite in their um, image making, if you like. So the structures, if you like, they're they're certain structures, and there's a confidence with them. These are really old. We're talking maybe 2009. Well, they're not that old actually, but 2009. Like it, you know, it is it's important for me to go back. Um, and I see the origins definitely in the blueprint of the painting exhibiting at the moment in the Luxembourg here. So, especially in this one. And I do return to the same motifs in painting over and over again. And I find that repetition very, very useful as a painter and very, very important because I always really love. I revisit and I relook, and I think that that's kind of very informative. The the size, the scale is forty by fifty, so these are all small paintings. At the time, you know, the economy wasn't performing very well, and I was exhibiting a little bit more abroad, so it was very useful to kind of have smaller work that I could kind of package in box and bring with me on airplanes. So it was very economical for me, if you like, to down down scale. Or downsize the work and have it very, very transportable. So that worked really well, especially going to New York. You know, it, uh, it's very cost effective, but also um, it was important to be able to deliver work in person at the time and, and meet and greet with the curators and, you know, have many conversations. So that was always very, very useful that they were small and manageable. So these works were all eventually exhibited in, or some of them, in the Futures Exhibition in 2009 in the Royal Hibernian Academy in Dublin. Um, Ruth Una Carroll and director Patrick Murphy uh, created the exhibition beautifully and I felt that they had a real understanding of my practice at the time and they exhibited some of these works alongside very abstract works and then other works that had kind of more colour combinations as paintings go so uh, they're fascinating things and people kind of converse about my vessel painting from 2006 uh, they also converse about these paintings from maybe 2009, 2010. So it seems like I, I'm being already, you know, kind of not boxed in, but kind of placed uh, with very clear kind of bodies of work in certain periods. So uh, they're very sculptural. Uh, when you look at them in person, you do notice like some shadows created by those lines. And those etched lines are gorgeous. Um, and the palette knife, it just Works very well as a, a process, and when I return to it now, it's certainly different. You know, it's not as uh, it's not as uh, 
it's not as easy if you like to kind of repeat past um, mark making that I would have kind of under, undertaken or understood. There's a stage like quality in these works, which I love. And there's definitely a preoccupation there with that kind of communal viewing area. They're very vacant as well. Um, so I love that, you know, they're unpeopled, the color, it's not that kind of, not that arresting on your first look, like they're slow paintings to view, you must view them slowly, and then you, you do kind of notice very delicate little things within them, so these lines, for example, are very delicate here in the image, but in real life they're even more delicate, if you like. Some of the brushwork in areas are very painterly, but they're very kind of contrasting work in person when you're with them and looking at them. So they were exhibited side by side with very abstract work. So this is a good example of works where I kind of uh, use marks in a particular way. And it's when I was looking at grids um, and pattern making, if you like, for my paintings, like, you know, I thought, oh, this is fascinating to have these works kind of side by side. Um, so they're very rich in color, many, many layers, and there's that depth of feel that they have. So a lot of these paintings, you know, are titled in series. So for example, um, eventually I started to kind of uh, wanting to kind of group them as such, if you like. And, you know, in 2009, exhibition titles, uh, you know, they always referenced kind of, uh, you know, liminal spaces or void or even, let's see, go back to a title here now, Christopher. One of my first titles, for example, would have been Actress on the Himmel platform, but always off Gaelga. They were always in Irish, and that was important to me at the time because I was making this kind of transition from, you know, a kind of Irish speaking home, if you like, to a home where I lived on my own. I'm really I started conversing with my paintings, to be honest. So I, I loved that um, use of languages in the work when I titled it, um, and titled shows and series and stuff. So Contours in Lena. Or the, um, the, uh, the Irish language uh, for me is very, very rich. That jumped, excuse me. So these works, uh, they're approximately 70 by 80 in size, uh, but very, very painterly. And again, I revisit works, so that's important and it will remain important to me. Uh, I started to introduce borders in the work. So this is one of the first paintings where there was a you know, a border, and I deliberately didn't put a border on the painting in the Gluckson because it just needed so much freedom, if you like. Uh, to transport itself anywhere really. So there's great movement in them. So I love that uh, eventually I became braver and introduced more colours. So this is a good example of that where by the linear structures like I introduced a third colour. So again very very painfully and people were very interested and curious about them. So there's these little stage sets you know and they are stage sets for me but again look at that very very three-dimensional. And maybe something domestic as well. There's something domestic about them. You know, these uh, linear structures, if you like, you know, you could just imagine maybe, you know, uh, landscapes and electrical poles, you know, running through landscapes. So uh, at times, like I'd sketch very densely around painting, you know, before I made them, after I made them, and I'd reflect. But, you know, that's not really. Um, that's not really informative for me at the moment because I'm in a making phase. So these grid paintings, like I very obviously kind of just immerse myself in making grid paintings. And I love these paintings uh, because they combine the grid with um, you know, the mark making, the central mark making, if you like. So um, I broke up the picture plane very, very easily. And I, I think the colors here, uh, they're just so rich actually, you know, the, the, the greens of those dusty salmon things. So the, the palette is always something I kind of go back to um, and really look at and relive. And you know, some of these colors, um, you know, their their bases are from Indian red, if you like, or Alizarin and Crimson. And I also take a lot of notes about those. So I love keeping. Um, I do not like keeping notes, but I did change uh, from one brand to another to another with uh, like a supplier. Um, Spectrum Paints, for example, closed down in Britain. They sold it. They closed down, then they sold it to a Welsh uh, paint maker, and they changed the kind of the contents of the the tubes of paint. And at the time, like it took me maybe three years to kind of uh, find myself again in the studio, whereby colours I could 
kind of create and mix colors to the, you know, to the code I wanted. So, you know, that really threw me off and I was fascinated by that. But Spectrum was in Wimbledon at the time and they used to sell the paintings through their little wooden hatch. And just sad to see such a small business really just go and then become part of something much bigger. Um, so I have a loyalty to brands and, and paint, uh, but, you know, really I wouldn't say I'm as uh, happy the spectrum has uh, changed and so, so that's, that's the kind of loss for me. Um, there's something really, really, um, you know, with the viewer's gaze, when you look at these, like you really have to, you really have to stop and, and take your time with them. The, the scale is intimate, 40 by 40, but I'd say that also about a six foot painting, it's an intimate scale, but there, there's something really suggestive about these colors and how they're combined. There's a lot of wet on wet and, uh, you know, I don't necessarily think images kind of portray that. So obviously there's nothing like the, the viewing experience in person. We all know that too well now with um, COVID and how the galleries kind of changed. So this is an install shot of those three grid paintings that I just showed you. This is from the High Lane Gallery in probably 2010, it was 2011. I had a photo exhibition there in an old church and it was vacuous. The space itself is huge and this um, kind of endless ceiling. And I love the quietness of the space and the paintings themselves, you know, just silence the walls, like it worked really, really well. And I, it afforded me, the space afforded me to kind of group things. And I love grouping things. And I think I have to do that as an artist to kind of uh, see where they fit and where they, uh, you know, where they can maybe bring me next. Uh, I love this painting, like it's kind of a circus theme. It's, um, it was part of the annual exhibition in the Royal Hibernian Academy in 2009, and it actually won an award, the Hennessy Craig Scholarship. Um, it was the first time I was, you know, I'm, it's the first time I was kind of caught off guard with it, and uh, it, it took me a while. Uh, it took me a while to really appreciate and understand this painting, with the color combinations, and anyway, it sold, and I just thought, oh, it's sold too soon. Like I would have loved to have lived with it, and I do like living with my paintings. If you notice, um, if, if the, anyone saw this in real life, you'll see there's an underpainting here, and the underpainting is of a very minimal structure with only two colors. And then the final painting on top there is obviously with the three colors. So each painting has these kind of um, layers and stages, and that you know you really have to just take your time with them. Uh, but to see the underpainting, it's, it's a real victory there, uh, always for me. So this is the painting in the Glucksman, and you know there's you know certainly some some elements of the paintings I've just shown you there. I think they're uh, very clearly present here. Obviously, there's probably 300 more on that memory stick, so we'll go backwards again. But the scale of this work, you know, it's um, six foot by six foot, as I said. But the mid bar and the cross were actually, you know, split it into four, which I love. Um, I thought that was just uh, very natural, but it is sculptural and it's kind of becoming part of um, the three dimensional kind of project that I'm undertaking now, uh, creating. Uh, well, structures, little structures similar enough maybe to the motifs that you can see here. But the painting does reflect on all my practice from the last, say, 20 years, the vessel paintings from 2006 and those structured paintings from 2009 and some other ones. So I'll just hopefully be able to find those for you now. But I love the linear, the, you know, the ingrook of this cochrober, I love the circles, I love that balance in this painting, it's very balanced. It took approximately two weeks to do a full full time. There was many, many layers with uh, washes of turpentine. And I was trying to visualize, I was probably trying too hard if you like to visualize a structure. I knew it would eventually kind of arrive at itself, but the the painterly qualities of this are uh, you know really important uh, for me. And to I don't want to imitate it again, but I would like to go back to that. You can see references to the underpaintings here to the left and to the right, and they'll have formed part of those many, many layers that went under it. The mid coat here is very painterly, really, it's just gorgeous. It's an inch and a half brush, so it's a flat head synthetic that uh, helps me kind of realize that surface, and it's gorgeous. So luscious, so, so luscious. The references to the painting again are here, you know, and I don't like that idea of perfection. The mid bar caused this incomplete um, 
you know, incomplete coming together, but that's also very important for the visual plane because the it's it's just broken up and it has to be, otherwise it, it won't it could never have been as successful. The split as well from the mid bar is here. Like I'm small, I'm on my knees in my studio and to realise left to right while painting it with the linseed oil left to right. It's you know, it's something very simple, which is quite difficult to do. And when you have to repeat it then to the right, it's not a mirror image, obviously, of that painting uh, or that other side of the painting, 50% of it's there from right to left, right to left. And I love that. I painted one side with my left hand, which is this left side, and then my right hand painted the right hand side. And you can see something more finished on the right hand side, in my opinion, compared to here on the left. Um, there's a lot of joy in this painting, and obviously, there's you know, you could. You could discuss it in many ways at the moment, unfortunately, like some of them not so pleasant, uh, some borders. But I, I do feel that it achieved a delicate balancing act. Um, you know, there's a kind of timeless depiction of place uh, in this painting. You know, and I also think it's, uh, you know, function kind of some very kind of like heavy loaded kind of commentaries on maybe, you know, you know banalities and contemporary life and you know could be part of an endless conversation it's a young painting and you really need to live with it for longer maybe to kind of you know be able to you know discuss more but the joy in the making of this painting you know this salmon pink you know I returned I found these colors again it was at least three hours mixing before I you know began painting that day I love the cadmium red I think it was really brave of me and I think brave because I felt confident that day that the painting became kind of closer to its completion like that I just left them there and you'll see that natural mid-bar split here again and um, you'll notice dippings in the painting here where they're more combined the the breaking of the synthetic head uh, it ends there's probably three or four inches here where it ends but it didn't throw me off so it's not a perfect split obviously so here uh, but again, that confidence, you know, there's a drier brush to the left, there's a wetter brush here to the right. So, you know, I'm really looking forward to kind of going back there. Uh, I just fixed up the painting ready to kind of, uh, you know, ready. I want to reapproach it basically. And I want to reapproach it based on this painting. And that's hugely informative for me, like that I do that. I always use paintings I painted to, you know, begin again, begin again, because you're always at the beginning, really. Um, anyway, so sorry, that jumped again. Told you I wasn't great, Christopher. This, these are, you know, structures that I unbuilt, if you like. So that painting itself, the surface is, you know, anyway, there's great contrast in this painting. And these are the ones I went back to revisit it and I unpainted them. And I stripped them back to the Indian red. Um, and the deconstructing process is as interesting as the constructing process in painting for me. I love the attention to the border base here. Uh, often my paintings are on platform. This is another example of the border, which has kind of flooded my paintings to date. I love the structure itself. Uh, it's an exciting kind of motif, the outline, the elements. Whoa, that's there again. So these are very thinly painted. Um, I love blue, but I find it very difficult to use it. So that's another area, like I want to go back to certain colours that I find difficult to use. But those uh, very simple paintings, combining structures with some abstract marks, they're really, uh, you know, they're, they're interesting. And let's go do that again. So this is for uh, one that I haven't unpainted. Um, interesting. The silence in some of these are so minimal. You know, the painting with Luxman, it's not that at all. It's not minimal, but it's uh, it's important, you know, to go back over the portfolio. And these are the ones I chose maybe to kind of help, you know, really understand it for myself a little bit more as well. Uh, these are more recent. This is more recent. This is 2019. And I love the kind of sculptural references in these paintings that I did. So this is from 2020. And again, the structures are kind of breaking through from very kind of uh, awkward looking shapes. But underneath it all together is a landscape and a reference to landscape. And references to landscapes are important. Uh, another painting, 
referencing sculpted folk sculpture today. So a lot of the paintings don't have titles. They're in series, so they're called um, yeah, Duel Number One, Duel Number Two, Duel Number Three, and then some of these smaller ones now I'm revisiting and titling again, which is good in both English and Irish. So it's not one or the other anymore. This is a painting that will be exhibited in the annual this year in the RHA annual. I'm excited to see that hanging inside a beautiful painting. Uh, these are other paintings that um, I really want to revisit as well. Uh, very, very loosely painted. I love the colour scheme and they, they look effortless, but really they're very difficult uh, to realise. Like I achieved two paintings, for example, um, in 2019, which I exhibited in the annual. This is the second one. Um, this is Monument 2. This is the third one. This is in the collection of the Royal Academy. It's my diploma piece. And it references landscape, um, landscapes from Lushgale. So this is the install shot of the three paintings together. And I always love that uh, relationship. So install shots are hugely important uh, for me, for my memory card, you know, for my own references. And these are paintings I'm working on at the moment. Uh, very, very simple again. Uh, gorgeous colours, much, much richer, in fact, than the paintings I just showed you there from 2009. So. So I was talking a little bit about titling, uh, titling work. So these are paintings that I'm revisiting, and I kept these for myself in the studio, uh, for you know my own my own self. And at home, I have shelves with some works that I kept, and I love taking them down, and I love looking at them. And I think it's really important because, as an artist, you know it's not it's not a uh, it's just not great for me to be looking at digital images. Like that's not necessarily going to inspire me or help me understand my work more. I do feel like I'm still an emerging artist. So in the very beginning, I thought I was, um, you know, an apprentice, an apprentice. And, you know, really, I'm only coming out of that phase, I think now, which is important for me, because I have to, uh, you know, relook at areas that I have to develop more. So titling work would be one of those or, you know, con contextualizing them a little bit more. And as I said at the beginning, I was beginning to write a little bit more about my work, and that's hugely important now. And the language I'm using is very, very simple, Sim similar to my painting. But I do think there's a kind of um, a shift towards that simplicity now for artists and how they communicate what they're doing and why they're doing it uh, to the general public. And I think it's hugely important to do that. I mean, it's a fascinating thing even to be on Zoom today with these images and trying to uh, relay the message, that daily uh, practice of painting to, you know, those on the other side of the Zoom call. So this and um, this painting in particular, like it's one I was very proud of. And I still don't know why. Uh, again, I mentioned simplicity an awful lot, but that it's a very hard thing to do. I pair back painting. So a lot of paintings can be very, very busy, very, very abstract or, you know, even elements of like maybe too figurative at times. So quietening them down is the battle. That's where the kind of real work uh, happens for me in the studio. So I don't tend to kind of uh, sit reflecting uh, with, you know, I don't tend to sit down reflecting too much about it. Like I do find that physical act of painting is something that, you know, we're kind of really re-looking really at as a community and, and how and why we we do what we do. So the some of the writing that I'm undertaking, it, it's about explaining it to myself as well and uh, that search for understanding. So being in a created exhibition, um, that like the one today, for example, home in uh, the Glucksman, like that also makes me, um, you know, it kind of makes my schedule a little bit busier, you know, so I have a backlog of things I have to write about, if you like, or talk about. So, these paintings are glorious, like they're awkward. They're not as slick as some of the surfaces of other paintings, and they're blotchier, and that's what makes them so interesting. And these are the ones I take out and I look at. Every time I begin a new body of work, and I do say a new body of work, so I will work in the studio, and after seven paintings are achieved, or if I've looked at what I wanted to look at at the time, and if I have uh, the seven paintings and I feel they've achieved something. I edit them eventually. So editing seven paintings, I'll probably keep two and then overpaint uh, the rest. And that is like, it's the cycle of the studio. And that's how it works because you'd never, I'd never personally be able to store the amount I paint. It's not, 
I said, just don't have those facilities. And I also don't have that appetite. And the paintings that I overpaint become part of the next phase, if you like, that next stage in my practice going forward. So these are lovely. And when you hold them in your hand, you really just balance them differently because some of the little edges here are so dense with paint. Like they make you smile. They create a, sh a, sh a shade or a score. And they're gorgeous. Again, those stage like structures, they're much braver paintings as well, I think, in, in part, which I love. This is one of my favorite ones. And this was retouched a few times as well. And that's interesting. I think the longer they're in the studio, the more they'll be retouched. And when you retouch them, you know, you have to be very, very careful uh, not to overdo that. Look at the yellow. That's uh, lemon yellow with cadmium yellow. I loved this painting and I had kept it. And unfortunately, I had to exhibit it and so, but it's one I really, uh, I wish I could look at in person a lot more. I just love the, the, the kind of fun painting and then the painted area and how it just balanced perfectly. So this painting I did in 2010, but I only exhibited it in 2018. So it's the year I became a member of the OHA and it, uh, uh, the painting itself just, it was a personal triumph, but also uh, sad to see it go, to be honest. Um, very, very simple. This area is only unpainted here, cadmium white. This is the, the last images I'll show you of the RHA Futures, uh, which I exhibited in and I referenced it in 2009, and how the curators hung uh, the series of abstract work with the series of linear work, and then the unpainted series, the blue series. It's a huge gallery. Gallery number one in the Royal Academy is huge. And again, I thought these paintings just worked perfectly with the great balance. When you see them all together, uh, I think they're nearly greater than some of their parts. Now, these are the first paintings, the vessel paintings, which I referenced. So these are often talked about. And I've only uh, a few to show you today. So, stage one. This is called waiting. This is six and a half foot by four foot. And this is in the collection of the Arts Council for Stall. So, these are, uh, you know, very typical of my work from 2004 to 2006. Look at Shanae. I think that's it, Christopher, regarding images now. Um, I love that one there. Ah, there I am. Happy. Happy at home. Hi, uh, welcome back. Um, and there's Sinead. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Good to see you. And thank you very much. Um, it was kind of a, it was a real um, kind of uh, almost like a studio visit in a way. I feel, I feel like we kind of really got a chance to see like a lot of your kind of practice and how it's developed um, over time as well. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I feel like I have a real understanding now of your practice, which is uh, um, I, always a, a fantastic thing. And just uh, before we get started, I have a few questions here just to say to uh, people watching at home um, that if you have any questions or comments or anything you want to share with Sinead, uh, there's a chat function. There's also Q and A, we can check both of them. So uh, by all means, please jump in. Um, but maybe I'll get the ball rolling if that's okay. Um, are you there okay, Sinead? I think a little glitchy. Right, all good. Okay, very good. Um, I, the first thing I was gonna ask you about, uh, and you touched on it a bit during the presentation, was actually the work that you're showing at the Glutzman at the moment. Um, a piece called, um, and I'm gonna probably mangle the pronunciation here, is it uh, Tehran uh, number six? Um, um, which rather unusually for this was an, uh, just to give a little bit of context, uh, the exhibition was an open submission um, uh, for proposals from artists. Um, and rather unusually, uh, you proposed a new, a new work, um, a work that wasn't already kind of made and ready to go. Um, and so I just was wondering, um, what was it about the kind of remit of the exhibition, the show on kind of contemporary Ireland and ideas of being and belonging um, that informed that painting and that made you um, kind of how that might have, I guess, kind of informed your processes of, of, of kind of realizing that work. 
it's um it's always something I battle with like home but I I always feel that um landscape and how I've always um if you like painted some aspects of landscapes whether it's um with a structure or a teardrop like a mountain or you know something obviously it'll have an ambiguous reading but just imagine those two uh like visual sets for me like I'm always looking like I always feel everything is a landscape if you like and I'm always looking for a home within that so I have to narrow it down to be honest where it's you know visually it's all I can achieve it's on a two-dimensional surface the canvas is in front of me and the I could relate the title of your exhibition very well with the motifs that I often look at so it was something I could relate to immediately and I sketched out a few um a few a few drawings and then uh just it helps me find a, a standard in my painting practice if you like it it, it, it did push me and at the time I did read the president's uh, press release and the you know the, the background of the actual exhibition which I found fascinating and unfortunately like there's a lot of noise I find when I read too much and I have to visually just settle it all down so it becomes the most simple motif again that I'm often used to and it is relatable to me obviously but it's it's also uh, you know, it's it was interesting because at the time I was painting it, there was an awful lot of talk on the radio too. So that's say an example of noise for me. So I had to turn off the radio because a lot of talk was about Brexit and the sea and the boundaries and a united Ireland and uh, you know Trump was very very loud as well. Like there was an awful lot of noise. Um, I find I have to just switch everything off to be honest and just bring it back to that canvas. You know, there's, I'm not, uh, and it's not, a, although it's a figurative painting, I don't think it's the most figurative painting I've ever done, if you like. And right. I think you can read into it. It's accessible. And I, yeah. I made it that way. I, I was like, continuity, like to... visual continuity is important. Your so I, I couldn't do uh... something. Huh? Sorry, there's just a little bit of delay, just a slight technical problems here. Now, yeah, I just want to say that the work certainly seems to kind of veer between kind of figuration and abstraction. Um, and, and I was kind of quite intrigued myself. Certainly, I remember even kind of seeing the proposal coming in and being kind of struck by this kind of kind of a more poetic uh, kind of reading on it, that it, it didn't feel kind of specifically geared to ideas of kind of nationalism or, or um, you know, all those things like kind of Brexit and kind of borders and these kind of things. Yeah. But kind of address them in a very kind of like a sideways kind of approach. So even this idea of kind of how you talk about borders within the frame um, in a way I think is always a really interesting in relation to kind of landscape and, and all the kind of baggage I think that painting kind of brings with it when it's kind of dealing with you know, depictions of kind of landscape and home as well, so. I love that I didn't put a border on it. It would have ruined it. Uh, visually, number one, it would have ruined it. And secondly, it made those sense the, those lines referenced uh, straightened maps for me. You know, I had I just straightened every line, you know, and like painting, it, it's a universal language. So it's, it can be understood in any part of the world. So, you know, there's no need for my border on this painting, nor there was no need. So at the time, you know, there are, there's a lot of conversations, but it, it really comes down to, um, you know, informed like responses and how informed, you know, it informs your practice. And the visual responses, you know, obviously your subconscious is working all the time, but it uh, it does resolve itself actually. But there there's a lot of access points in that painting, which you know really will be worth sitting down to think about and write about. I find I'm just too busy, and I don't have the same energy levels I would have had. Maybe, you know, I'm 20 years out of college now, which I was only thinking about, and and what a way to celebrate it to have this painting in the Glucksman, and you know, it, it like. The title of that exhibition could have been relevant 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 80 years ago. So it's it's, it's always going to be relevant and something we're always going to be discussing. Um, I did a lot of studies, Christopher, about that painting. Um, I'll just I'll just show them here to you if I can. Mm -hmm. So, for example, this is Paul Shea. I'm in my studio and I'm just going to try and turn the camera onto this one. And I'm taking some of the parts of that painting now <coughs> that's in the Glucksman. And I'm reconfiguring them. So that will be number one. And then number two is very, very light. But the same structures are used in the painting. And regardless of what themes nearly, the visual language just does, it's always, um, 
you know, you can see the continuity and you can see the artist's hand and you can see the artist's kind of repertoire of mark making. So I did these three four foot studies or painting, sorry. And then I've undertaken a series of studies, Christopher, if I can move you over here to the floor. This camera's upside down. Can you see those, Christopher? Mm -hmm. Yeah. These, these studies. So I'm taking it to a more figurative level, really, uh, the motif that I used in the painting. And I'll be very interested to see where it brings me in maybe six months time, because I think I'll need six months uh, to achieve it. But I'm, I'm fragmented all the time with uh, areas I study in painting. And there's multiple titles that you could use and reference. And, you know, I think sometimes I probably don't use language enough, if you like, to articulate the content of paintings. And then sometimes I think I overdo it. You know, like all I have to do is look at a painting. You know, I really, I really trust myself and I trust myself as a viewer in that experience. So, but I find it fascinating uh, that, uh, I just find it fascinating combining both language and then the visual language together. I mean, I also wanted to ask you about this, this, these motifs that you, you, you return to kind of throughout your practice. Um, and I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on these kind of images and icons and how you decide upon them. I mean, what is it about structures, domiciles, buildings and vessels uh, that you find uh, particularly intriguing? Um, how, uh, what is it that kind of attunes you to the, those particular, um, I don't want to even call them objects, but uh, these kind of sites almost in a way? Yeah, I do think they are objects. You know, I, I am more I am more inclined now to, I, I do want to do those three dimensional works really. I do think I'm coming off the canvas now with uh, a three dimensional, like with, with uh, like if they're clay based products. So, you know, it, you know, the, the relationship is there definitely. So I do think they are very three dimensional structures. Why, if I, I, I genuinely, I have to keep looking. I think, although I'm only 20 years out of college, like, you know, I'd love to know in maybe another 10, 20 years, if I know any more than I do, you know, I do, I do wonder why, like, and there, that continuity is there, that visual continuity of motif, why? Like, why would one need to do that? I mean, if I knew what I'd do it, I don't think so. You know, I don't, I genuinely, I'm, I'm nearly too, uh, I'm nearly too involved to stand back properly and genuinely look at it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that's why I am forcing myself to write. I mean, I always want to have a contentment with my visual practice. You know, so the desire as a painter, you know, it, like, the structures are hugely important, obviously, and then the the motifs, they give a lot of purpose, you know, and I do have to, you know, some see something fixed at times on the painting surface to use it for the next phase or body of work. Like, I'm, I think I'm very young, 20 years out, to be honest. Yeah, I'm definitely young. I'm uh, working with Joanna Laws at the moment uh, and, and writing and just sharing some text about work and stuff like that. So, I mean, I think I'm a young student still, genuinely. Uh, like. It's, it's, I mean, it's interesting as well, kind of, in the, you know, because your work obviously seems to deal with, you know, some of the history and, and of kind of modern kind of painting. Um, and actually, when you talk about three dimensionality, of course, that almost goes against uh, what we think of when we're looking at, the, you know, the picture plane and ideas of kind of the, the, the surface qualities uh, of the paintwork. So this kind of, this process kind of etching into the, the canvas gives it a, a three dimensionality, but that seems mirrored by the content then as well, when you're kind of depicting, you know, vessels or, you know, spaces that um, have kind of a volume to them. Um, so there's a, a tension there, I think, which is kind of quite interesting. That seems to, to, to really feel it, I think, when you're, you're actually looking at the work. Yeah, the drawing elements of works from 2009, it, the, like I was drawing, I was drawing with paint, you know, and I'm not so sure if that was, um, you know, like I'm not sure why I obviously ended up with the palette knife fetching in these lines, but they were very uh, dimensional and you unfortunately have to have them in your hand nearly to see that and the, the detail, the, the, the level of detail, the three dimensional, uh, I do see very three dimensional work, like the piece in the Gluckson could just be come off on wheels mm. and be trolleyed out. And that, that's what I'm trying to, uh, understand now with my 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 clay basically you know uh, what uh, what what why when how 
uh, yeah, we might sit here in 20 years and I may know more. Um, I'm going to um, do something a little unusual. So I'm going to read you like a little bit of text here um, that that I that your work kind of made me think about, especially because you're talking about ideas of kind of borders and grids. And of course, Rosalind Krauss's essay, Grids, where she talks a little bit about this idea, I guess, in relation to the painting. And she says, uh, and if you'll bear with me, uh, she says, uh, logically speaking, the grid extends in all directions to infinity. Any boundaries imposed upon it by a given painting or sculpture can only be seen according to this logic as arbitrary. By virtue of the grid, the given work of art is presented as a mere fragment, a tiny piece arbitrarily cropped from an infinitely larger fabric. Thus, the grid operates from the work of art outward, compelling our acknowledgement of a world beyond the frame. And it just made me think of, of your work in a way, and this particularly because I had to do a little bit of writing myself about, of course, your work in, in the Glucksum as well, and this notion that you talked about, about the lines kind of extending outwards or kind of going beyond the canvas. Um, and I wonder how you consider this notion of kind of the grid or the repeated pattern and its implications for extending beyond the canvas. I mean, do you see your works as maybe fragments of a larger image or even fragments of a broader, longer practice? I definitely see them as fragments of a broader, longer practice. And, you know, we're here for such a, sh a short amount of time in life. And, you know, a percentage of the brain, how much I use, very, very little, obviously. It's, um, yeah, the, the linear quality of those etched lines, for example, are the very painterly lines the where the straightened maths in, in in the painting and the gloves and so the it uh you know it's it's the connectivity and without that it'll it'll have no meaning in the end you know or towards the end but i'm not looking for a conclusion although i feel paintings are an ending in themselves i'm i'm not looking for a conclusion and i don't i don't feel i truly need uh you know a, a, a bit more understanding at the moment because it's for me based on visual understanding and then to exhaust that visual potential is, is the most important thing that's the inquiry and that's the essence of my practice if, if that makes sense mm -hmm. but the that it it is without borders so you know there's multiple conversations that can happen and i think they can happen in retrospect so i do think i can go back to the vessel paintings of 2004 and have a more thorough understanding about um, the art language if you like and maybe uh, you know, things I had touched upon many years ago and kind of post-colonial thought and little, you know, little kind of texts and conversations around it. And then I can go on to 2009 with the linear work and then I can, so I'm already beginning to see groupings, if you like, more clearly. The uh, grid, you know, it, like it'll become a pattern. You know, the pattern is becoming, it, it's gather, it's coming together slowly, but it's being painted. It's, is it something you know it's been in reflecting upon your work, say, yeah. for example, like a conversation like this, I, I always wonder about that process that uh, artists kind of go through when they're asked to kind of present about, you know, a career that, like you said, extends back 20 years and 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 to start kind of seeing um, maybe things that weren't even visible at the time of uh, yeah. you know, certain correlations or certain kind of trajectories that you may be followed uh, even unconsciously or unintentionally. Yeah, 100%. And I think, um... I love I love artist conversations and I, I wonder how how and what we'll be doing in the future, you know, after Zoom, like we're probably all zoomed out nearly, but you know, in the future, what shape will openings ha uh, take, for example, you know, with the you know, with the standard press release, we've this, we've the, you know, uh, the wine receptions. You know, I, I wonder about new introductions to works and how we can uh, you know include audiences if you like. You know, when you do a studio visit, for example, it's nearly easier to be in the home of your studio to, you know, make it relevant to, to you know, audiences and to create an understanding. You know, a five year old will understand my painting, my opinion, you know, quicker than I will. That's in the Glucksman. Like, I'd love to be at the education talk. Um, and I do think it's as simple as that, you know, but whether or not the artist is the person who should be in the middle of that conversation, really. You know, the works for me right now are just enough, you know, mm. but I am looking for new routes uh, into understanding it because it is relevant to understand my own pattern and then the, the makings and all these clusters together, because there is an awful, like there's a volume of work there. You know, I have portfolios, a very large portfolios, really, and the work's very well collected. But, you know, combining that, I'm just currently finishing uh, printing uh, new publications and it'll be just interesting to see what examples I took from bodies of work to 
bring them together in you know in paperback format um yeah like if i if if i knew what i and why i was doing it i wouldn't do it i think i think i'd just give up you know like yeah i just i think i'd give up i think i'd begin something totally new you know but it's all i know and unfortunately it's um yeah yeah it's i i i'm i'm always learning you know genuinely which i love yeah my knowledge is just i'm gathering information all the time you kind of preempted something i want to ask you about as well was this idea and you mentioned again and i really like this idea of always beginning again in your practice um in fact that excuse me you go back to uh, difficult colors um and it, you know, it seems aligned with your recent writing on your own work as a process of self-discovery so do you see these processes of one of as one of refinement or getting closer to some sort of essence of your practice or do you see this process as the essence of your practice itself um in a way maybe yeah. you kind of touched on this in your previous uh, response but uh yeah the, the, the essence of the process itself is not it's um yeah 100 percent i mean essentially you're self-employed you know you depend on public art spaces to introduce your work to the general public to fellow artists peers critics collectors uh, and then you're hopefully connected maybe to a commercial gallery that introduced the work to another set or another audience but it's you know it's these multiple networks uh yeah so the essence of that itself like unless i have something that i need to discover like I, it's not going to motivate me like I'm very motivated and it's the physicality of painting that you know that's the driving force like that's the that's that's all of it so preparing colors and really trying to find the colors of my past or a color I'd uh, used etc etc like it it's not as easy you know because it's a daily practice of painting it is easier for me but it's it's never easy it's always the beginning Christopher it's never yeah, it's always the beginning. Like I'm doing studies now of linear structures. Like I'm back to the beginning. And I'm like, oh, this looks familiar, but it's not a bit familiar. It's a different time. The time is referenced very differently in 2004 in some of these paintings that I've uh, showed you to 2009. And now I'm here 2021 and I'm, you know, wet on wet. Uh, yeah, it's just like I'm back here again. And that memory of that experience is hugely important in the DNA of an artist especially a young artist, you know, I don't claim to know anything. And I'm always hoping to reveal something new to myself. And those revelations motivate the following day's work. So I have a four foot canvas on the easel. In fact, it's the same easel as James, Han James Hanley owns, which delights me. But that painting, I had a really successful day painting a day ago, say, and at the end of the day, I put up a canvas, raw canvas, I did just so beautifully standard. And then I just put down a, a rough draft and I did that deliberately to frustrate myself, to bring me back to the studio the next day to continue to paint again, to go back to the beginning. Um, I think there's a time here. If anyone has any questions, by all means, uh, um, put post them into the chat function there. But I do have one here from our audience, which is, um, I think, quite a good one. What does the studio mean to you? <laughs> Home. Yeah. If I'm not here, I want to be here. If I am not here, I really do want to be here, especially when I'm engaged. Like I'm basically preparing work now for 2021, 2022 and 2023. So like I feel I'm in a making phase at the moment and I have a few exhibitions scheduled and I have some essays commissioned and I have publication to print. But for me, the studio is my most desired place. And the state, it's how I feel when I'm in here and how familiar I am with everything that is here. It's, it's everything, it's the smell, it's the kettle, it's all my rags, they're as relevant as the finished paintings that I'm going to exhibit. You know, my, my dirty brushes, I talk to my brushes. You know, when I'm cleaning them, I talk to them. Like, it's an extension of my body. You know, it really is all and everything. And I don't even, I do think if it was, um, a studio conversation like it, it's easier to possibly understand it but Henrietta Street really was a dream in the day because all I ever knew of were all as a student that all these artists had worked and lived there and you know I thought I want to live here you know it, it's something I desired I had a visual of it and then I ended up there you know not by accident just by design and it 
just the making of me, just the most positive life experience. You know, Sean Scully, I remember meeting him for uh, an interview I had to do with him for TV years ago, and he, he stood there telling me about all these profound experiences that he had. And I believe him. You know, at the time I was thinking, we're not going to get enough content for tape here because the profound experience, by the time he told you the profound experience, he only gave you a few sentences, but actually I completely understand uh, what he meant, you know, that day. With all I've experienced now in my own little home here, my own little studio, you know, it, it, they are those revelations about applications with your synthetic brushes, the mixing, the turpentine, you know, all those little things that becomes the whole public, you know, whatever you put out to the public, like you're an evil, be an evil, an umlon, an umlon or father and shin nasum, or this curtray mach, like a she no dura and a she la fecal. So, yeah, no, I love my studio. Although it's very, very small, I don't desire another one because the walls have my memory there, they have everything. Um, I just want to say, um, I'm, I'm afraid we've already <laughs> come up to two o'clock. Um, You're secretly I, delighted. I, I'm, I'm only getting started. Oh, uh, I, I, keep Clark. Going. I can keep, definitely keep going, but I just it want to say... sounds like a, a superhero's name, Christopher Clark. <laughs> well, yeah. most say Chris. <laughs> okay. But it's nice hearing some say Christopher. It's very formal. <laughs> Christopher Clark. Um, but I just want to say a, a big, big thanks, Sinead. Um, it's been a real pleasure. And, and thanks so much for kind of sharing also, like, and, you know, not just your, your practice, but like actually your studio itself there as well. It's, uh, it's, it's great to see you, uh, you working away. And, uh, and I, I look forward to um, seeing what's, uh, what's on the horizon. Um, and thanks to everybody for, for taking part today as well. But uh, um, thanks for organizing it, Chris. And thanks to Mark very much for the technical support. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah.